<laughs> okay, okay. So it is being recorded, right? Okay, Albina has recorded it. Um, so Sean, uh, the reason why, one of the reasons why we are recording it because uh, first of all, we are going to put this on 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 the local media, so they might publish it. And having it having a recording is you know it's like a, a justification, a stronger evidence for, that we actually did this. Um, and the second one is that a lot of the some of the participants, some of the teachers texted me that they they said they really wanted to come, but because it's actually a school day in Malaysia, so they couldn't make it. They they have classes today at this moment. So they would like to ask for recording so they can watch it later and of course get the the credit points for continuing instruction department. So it is being recorded. Uh, I hope everyone is okay with that. Uh, so Sean, um, I think the, the screen is yours. Makasi, Sirhajwan, Salamat Tang, Namasaya, Sean, Robinson, Saya, Bisa, Bichara, Bahasa, Malay, Sedikit, Sedikit Saja. Uh, saya tinggal di Indonesia uh, dua tahun. Saya belajar uh, uh, Inggris uh, di Jakarta. And that's probably all the Malay that you are going to hear from me. Uh, but I wanted to use my Malay a little bit because, uh, yeah, it's great to connect with you on uh, in your language. So, uh, as Sir Hodge once said, my name is Sean Robinson. It's pronounced Sean, uh, although it's uh, spelt S-E-A-N. Uh, so sometimes that gives some of my workshop participants just a little bit of trouble, but it's Sean. Uh, it's an Irish name. And I hail from British Columbia, Canada. I teach science and digital literacy uh, at a high school here. And uh, I'll go through a, an approach to teaching that I've been using. Uh, we're coming up on a decade now that I've been working at this. And I get really excited about connecting with other educators around the world because the way I like to share it is that this is something for every teacher. It's not something for just, you know, the, the great teachers, the Global Teacher Prize finalists, which I know Sir Hajwan is also a finalist as well. Uh, but this is something that I believe any educator can do. Uh, so uh, the way I explain it, I hope I can explain it in a step-by-step -step process to help you to understand uh, how to employ it into your classroom. I'm going to share my screen so that uh, I uh, uh, can show you uh, a few things. First, just a title page here that shows some of my socials, let's say. So Twitter, or now called X, you can connect with me at sr underscore tutor. Uh, Instagram, it's teachcbl. And also I put a suggested hashtag for our session for today uh, because uh, you know, if you do share out, it's always good to have a hashtag. A hashtag does connect people together. Now, a little bit about me. I'm an elementary trained middle school teacher that just happens to be teaching high school students and adults right about now. I've taught students from uh, four years old to 79 years old, almost 80 years old. So I have taught the range of uh, teachers with, in, in the range of needs. Uh, I'm currently teaching science and digital literacy right now. So, you know, some of the focus that I have and maybe some of the examples will be around science. I've written two books and this, these are great places where you can get more information. One is called Connections Based Learning, a framework for teaching and learning in a connected world. And that's the first book that really goes through the whole framework. And then I focused on one part of it and, and that's called the Connection Lens teach with the power of human connection. And there's three lenses to connection-based learning, and that's the first one. And uh, maybe one day I'll finish off with the, the next two. Uh, as Sir Hajwan said, uh, I have won a few awards, uh, both in my province here in Canada, and also the Global Teacher Prize, uh, a finalist for the Global Teacher Prize, and most recently a guest award winner as well. Uh, and connectionsbasedlearning.com, uh, if you can see that at the bottom, that is a place where 
you can find a lot of information about connections-based learning. If you want to reach out, that's a great place to reach out as well. I love this quote because uh, this quote really summarizes how I'm going to come to you, my posture here. It's from Wab Canoe, and he is an Indigenous person here in Canada. He's actually a director of Indigenous inclusion at the University of Winnipeg. He's also a hip hop artist, a broadcaster, and a politician as well. And he says, I come to you humbly, not to tell you what to do on your journey, but to share with you what I have learned on mine. I love that quote because that gives me um, a chance just to share with you what I do. And I hope that the things that I share will resonate with you and that you'll be able to use some of the uh, ideas that you find out here. I'm on a mission and my mission is to make the educational landscape a more connected place. You can see here I'm connecting with uh, students in Uganda or this is a the second picture is a, a connection uh, with the Dominican Republic where you can see Eladio in the background on the screen and then some students in the front. And my learning intention for the hour that we have together is to deepen your understanding of connections-based learning and help you apply it in the classroom. Now, uh, many times by this point, people may have uh, lost focus, but I, I do want you to focus here. I want you to take a cleansing breath. And then I want you to think about a time when you first looked at some student learning outcomes for a class that you were about to teach. So if you can think about a time you were looking at student learning outcomes for a brand new class, and when you consider the learning outcomes for a class you're about to teach, what's the first thing that you do? This is a chance for you to do some discussion. I know that we have a chat here, so you can hopefully see my face again and uh, you can just add some comments in the chat. I have stopped sharing, so Sir Hajwan, I'll be able to see the comments as well. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, hello. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, so I'm going to copy and paste the questions on the on the chat. So everybody. Um, so Sean just asked us, when you consider the learning outcomes for a class you're about to teach, what is the first thing that you do? So you may respond, you can unmute yourself. Uh, we are welcome to do that. Or you can write it on the chat. So we'll give you some time to, you know, to think about that. Sure, yeah. <laughs> when you consider the learning outcomes for a class you're about to teach, what is the first thing that you do? Here's an example of what somebody might say. So you look at the learning outcomes, you need to find the right textbook. That might be a start for somebody. That's the first thing I do. I find the, the right textbook. Somebody else might say, well, I need some resources, not necessarily a textbook. I might find some paper resources. I might look back and see what I've done in the past that can connect with what I'm about to do. Any other ideas? Yeah, and feel free to unmute and share your ideas as well. I know it's early in the morning there, uh, so <laughs> it, it might be a little bit to, uh, to get started. Oh, so I see a few things coming in. Uh, so Mark Lynn says, I will check on the authenticity of materials first. Yeah, very good, right? We have to check on the materials, just making sure that they're authentic. You want to consider the level of the students and choose the suitable methods or activities to be used in the class. And that's from Kira. Thanks, Kira. Yeah, I appreciate that. Anyone else? Well, somebody might say, well, yeah, I've got to find some 
YouTube videos as well. I've, I, uh, so that I can, you know, show some great videos in the class. Of course, you're thinking about your, uh, uh, the materials and activities, those kinds of things. Uh, here I see, I will look for some suggested activities online that I could use for that particular topic and skill specifically for that lesson. Fantastic. Sir Hajwan. So yeah, everybody. Um, so you can just keep thinking about it and you keep, uh, I'm just going to face the question again, you know, um, so you just type your answer on the chat. Okay. And, and Sean, if you would like to continue, you may do so. And then you can, we can look at it back because sometimes some of the teachers are taking their time to think about it. But sure. yeah, we really appreciate this if you can respond uh, yeah. to this question because I think this one is something that is very relevant to all of us when we are about to teach. Yeah, uh, the, the reason why I'm asking this question is because I'd like to show you something a little bit different. I want you to think about making a connection. I want you to think about well, what if before I start looking for my materials, before I start you know, gathering the resources, looking for the textbook, that I make a connection with somebody. And the question is, who can we engage as we learn? Now, I'm a firm believer in the power of a question, the fact that one great question can change the world, really. And uh, when I think about this question, who can we engage as we learn? It applies to pretty much any age and any, uh, any topic, any department, whether it's social studies, science. I'm going to focus on science and I'm going to show you how this one question can change your practice. So here we have electricity. And you can see the content that I might teach, circuits, voltage, current, resistance, I might have to teach Ohm's law, but more and more we're finding that in the 21st century, we're getting these competencies. So also in British Columbia, I have to teach to cooperatively design projects with local and or global connections and applications. They're asking me to consider social and ethical and environmental implications of the findings from uh, or for the students from their own or others' investigations. They want the students to contribute to care for self, others, community, and the world through personal or collaborative approaches to contribute to finding solutions to problems, global solutions, local solutions, and demonstrate a sustained intellectual uh, engagement in a topic or problem of personal interest. So we have these competencies and this content. And what I'm saying is when you are faced with this, uh, the content or the competencies, that you find a who. Who can we engage as we learn? And so that's what I did. I sent out this email to Catherine Nakabugo. Now, Catherine now um, is also a Global Teacher Prize Top 50 finalist, 2018. And this is before I was involved with the, um, uh, with the Global Teacher Prize. But I knew about Catherine and I wanted to connect with her in regards to electricity. So I sent this email, as simple as an email. I'm so excited to connect with you regarding electricity use tomorrow. I really appreciate you making your class available to chat with us. My thoughts are that we would have students share a little about our class, our daily lives, our electricity use. Then we could talk about how to collaborate together to help solve problems that arise. How does that sound? So that's my initial connection, and this is how it went. I'm really excited to be able to share this uh, moment uh, with, I, I think, so it's Gombe High School, is that right? Yes. Yeah. yes. And, and we're Riverside High School here. And so my name is Sean Robinson, and I'm a science and digital literacy teacher here. And so it's really cool to connect with uh, Catherine Nagabugo uh, and uh, her students in Uganda. I, I'm hoping to hear some of the issues that uh, uh, the average person in Uganda is facing. And so I wanted to ask about access to clean drinking water. And I did want to talk about uh, access to electricity as well. 
you are seeing that the thing is what, they are, what she's talking about yeah. is, is that we have electoral power in the town, but 90% uh, of the rural areas don't have electricity, so they use uh, solar energy to provide electricity to them. So we had an excellent time connecting with our learning partners in Uganda. And now it's time to see what we can do to help out. We learned that 90% of the rural communities have no access to electricity. And so it's our turn to make a response to that. So why don't you post here what your idea for a response is? So that was a video that I put uh, up on Flipgrid to get my students thinking about how they would respond. And that brings me to a favorite part of the process. And that's where I get to say, now that we know what we know, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to make about it? Make, uh, thinking of that idea of makerspace. And these are also some great questions that I think can change the world. And then I have my students create their own learning goals. So here we have Edward. He wanted to uh, provide a fresh source of water for the people in Uganda who do not have access to, to clean water. And his hope was to create a fully functioning prototype for, uh, for clean drinking water. And of course, I would respond. So that's me writing in the red. You know, that would be amazing. I also have Kyle who said, you know, I hope to address their electricity needs. So, so Kyle's learning goal was to learn some simple electrical component circuits uh, and uh, to bring a solar charger together with those components to be able to support the students in Uganda. Now, these are their ideas, okay? Not my own ideas. And I just want to support the learning. So uh, Edward and his team, they started working on a straw that the students could use to uh, get clean drinking water through this straw. And Kyle and Braden and their group, they started looking into creating something solar that would help the students, a solar powered computer. And here's where things went. And if you can't hear what uh, what's going on here, uh, these students connected with other people so that they could support the connection. Connections beget more connections. And they were able to get these solar panels for a cheap price uh, and start building some kind of solar computer that the students in Uganda could use because they didn't have access to electricity. We always come back to our learning partners to get feedback. Are we on the right track? Are the things that we're doing, are they going to be helpful to you? So we would you know, have different groups. Each table represented a different group working on a different project. And then to be able to chat with Uganda again to say, hey, are we on the right track? Do we need to make any changes? How are we doing? And the students were able to take this project all the way. I was able to bring those computers to Uganda. Uh, you can see Catherine Nakabugo there and the, the solar panels with the computers. The second picture is, it isn't as good, but it actually tells a bigger story because now the students from Uganda were interacting with my students from Canada because they couldn't all come but they were interacting on their public digital portfolios. And we were also able to take this to a rural community. And the rural community was able to use these solar powered computers as well. Now, this project might seem like, you know, wow, how did all this come together? But it really, it started with a connection. Now, did we meet the learning outcomes? You know, did students learn about circuits? You know, they had to learn about resistance and voltage. We had to have the, the right kind of current, the right amount of current to be able to power the computers. So then they learned about, you know, Ohm's law, voltage, current, and resistance. But they also completed a lot of what it says there in those competencies about cooperatively designing projects with global connections 
I, I hope that you can see how that applies. Uh, implications of their findings, making contributions to the community and the world uh, and finding solutions to problems, local and global solutions. So uh, I believe that, you know, I can prove, hey, they met these learning outcomes. But time and time again, my students have had these powerful connections that led to them uh, accessing and gaining the learning outcomes. So my students have connected with Saul Mwame, a global goals activist, uh, Krishma Bagani, a water purifier creator, a local politician, a submersible engineer who works on submarines, a stem cell researcher that maybe I'll talk about a little bit later that is talking about cutting edge stem cell research, a planetary scientist, a World Bank representative, a battery expert to help us with our uh, use of batteries with our solar panels, a Yemeni activist, a fellow with Huntington's disease, who we were able to support and create adaptive technology to help him with his needs, with the difficulty in moving and getting up, uh, up off the couch. Uh, we connected with D the Dominican Republic. I have a great um, YouTube talk about that connection and building uh, um, solar powered lanterns for the people in the Batays, the uh, shanty towns, the Haitian shanty towns in the Dominican Republic. And we also made a connection with uh, Catherine Acabugo's girls' school. So all these connections provided for my students um, an opportunity to gain more meaning, more motivation, and a chance to make a difference. And that's what I wrote about in, in my books. I'm looking at the second one called The Connection Lens. So I have these six R's that take um, really any educator and shows them step by step how to do this kind of teaching. I'm just going to focus on these three here, okay, for our talk today. And that's rethink, reframe, and reach out. So let's talk about rethink. You're probably wondering, you know, uh, Sean, what about the research? What does the research say about this kind of learning? I have two studies that I want to share. One is a Canadian study. Uh, called What Did You Do in School Today? And that was a study where um, uh, Doug Wilms, Sharon Friesen, and Penny Milton took a look at how students, as they went through their school career and as they got older, they were less and less engaged. And they found that in high school, that uh, less than 50% of the students were engaged. So they looked at how, you know, where should we be heading? How can we stop this disengagement? And they realized that they need to help students to see how subjects are interconnected, that the students would be solving real problems, that they would learn from and with each other and people in their community, that they would uh, make a difference in the world and connect with experts and expertise. And this really supports the use of connections-based learning in the classroom. I've got one more study here by Krutka and Carano, all right, that I'll share with you in a second. But uh, from this particular study, what did you do in school today? Uh, some of the quotes were that the education needs to be relevant, meaningful, authentic, that students uh, need opportunities where they're connected to the world outside the classroom on page 34. And students want stronger relationships with their teacher, but also with their communities locally, nationally, globally on page 35. And then, uh, like I said, a study from Krutka and Carano. This is a 2016 study where they looked at the uh, scholarly literature on video conferencing. So in particular, just having that video conference where uh, we're sitting in a class and we're connecting with somebody uh, maybe from another country uh, and they wanted to see, you know, what are some wise practices for educators there? And they found that whether we aim to address environmental concerns, reduce prejudice or pursue specific projects to make a, a better world, video conferencing can transcend geographic boundaries and provide an impetus for action. It's a passport around the world and it opens our students um, their eyes to their place in this world but not just the place in this world but really their responsibility 
for this world. And that's what a video conference can do, one of these connections can do. So that's just a little bit of the research. You can find more on connections uh, um, in, uh, on the website, connectionsbasedlearning.com. Uh, but that's really the, uh, the first thing that I want you to do is to just consider, you know, the power of connection. The next step is to reframe. So you've got your learning goals, but reframe them in terms of who. Who can we engage as we learn? All right. So uh, we want to change the question from what or how to who, who can we engage as we learn? And uh, the connection lens looks at four different kinds of connections, four different who's, okay? Connecting with the community, with experts, with organizations, and with classrooms around the world for global partnerships. Each of those connections has, different, has a different power to it. You can just imagine that connecting with the community has a different, um, different facets to connecting with an expert and what students might learn from that, or uh, connecting with an organization where resources are shared. Either you give resources to an organization or you receive resources from an organization. And also, if you consider connecting with other students, so global partnerships, that's another type of connection. So really leveraging these different kinds of connections is what connections-based learning is all about. So this is really the connection lens, just putting on a kind of lens to be able to see connections around you that can empower your classroom, all right? So let's just take a look at a few learning outcomes. And I'm going to go through this uh, pretty quick because I want to really engage with uh, any questions at the end. But if you consider this learning outcome, OK, students will learn vocabulary around volunteer experiences that stimulate entrepreneurial thinking and innovative thinking. OK, I've got a little video that shares about a project that we were able to use to help students gain this, um, this competency. So you can see this uh, video was my partner and I, we were sharing with students um, an assignment where we would ask them to make a connection with somebody in the community, somebody doing something that they are passionate about. And uh, I don't have time to go through some of the, the really you know cool things that students come up with. Uh, I do have one student, uh, it was pretty cool. He connected with a fella who was building pinball right, machines. So and he put together a video here where he's chatting with uh, uh, with um, the uh, person. But you can just imagine how students, uh, when they make a connection, they give to their connection, but they also receive from the connection. All right. So let's take a look at what they give to the person whom they're connecting with. So this gives a person a chance to share their knowledge. Maybe they're they're bottled up with this knowledge. They, um, they, you know, they've worked at their at their job for many years, but they've never had anybody to share uh, what they've learned. And a student comes to them and says, "Hey, I'd like to learn more about what you do." 
So this gives to their connection a chance to, to, to share a little bit of themselves. Uh, you can help them for free, some kind of help. You share out what they're doing. You give them honor and recognition. You share their ideas. But you also receive from that connection. You receive a wealth of resources. You get help for free. And you know maybe it's a, a career opportunity. Uh, and you can leverage parents uh, of the students. You can leverage alumni. So community engagement gives just a lot of opportunity for students. Now that's one type of connection, connecting with the community. Well, what about connecting with experts? Take a look at this learning outcome. Students will develop scientific language about emerging technologies, okay? For this one, we connected with a stem cell um, uh, engineer and uh, here's just a little bit. I'll just share a little bit of what that connection was about. Hi. So hopefully you can hear. Hi, Karis. Can you see? Can you see me? I can see. Yeah. Okay, and you can hear me. Uh, just wanted to welcome you to our Science Nine class. Here we are at Riverside Secondary. Uh, just a reminder. Uh, if I, I share this with um, others of my staff, it's uh, Sean Robinson, and uh, this is Karis. And Karis, uh, we're so thankful that you're able to share with us this morning. Um, we've got a few questions, but we're super interested in what you're doing with stem cells. Uh, it's great to hear something that is current, like, you know, happening now, because it, seems, it sounds like the, the research uh, is just going leaps and bounds. And so uh, mm -hmm. super excited to hear what you have to say. I'm just going to have Hannah kind of introduce us, uh, and then we'll give you a chance to... Um, uh, to talk about yourself. Right. So you heard uh, me talk about uh, another a student that was coming up. I, I do a little bit of talk to introduce things, but I try to hand over the work of these connections to the students. Now, if you take a look at the picture on the left, I had two screens going for this connection and Karis was telling us about human induced pluripotent stem cells. And it was fascinating because the students were getting the most current research on stem cells. And particularly, these are the kind of stem cells they, they can make from your liver or your blood or your skin. And it really takes away the controversy around embryonic stem cells. And I thought, you know, do, does everybody know about these, these human-induced pluripotent stem cells? And not many people did because it's a current technology. But you can just imagine sitting in that class, connecting with a real researcher and getting the most recent tech, uh, technological know-how uh, from the person. The last thing I want to share with you is reaching out. Now, maybe you've gotten to the place where you're thinking, well, okay, but where do you find all these connections? How do you do it? Well, you know, when I've tried to reach out to any kind of connection here i'll show the next slide here sean uh, i'm the electrical group manager here i'm happy to participate in the skype call or two right so i've i i connected uh to uh, nutco research and they said hey you know what would love to connect you know uh is a webcam going to work for you or hi sean mr ron mckinnon who is a, a local politician has asked me to follow up he'd be thrilled to participate in a Skype chat, right? So uh, these are just uh, facts to verify that it, you know it's not as hard as you think. Most of the time, when you reach out to these connections, they're you know maybe they'll say no, but a lot of time they'll say yes, and they'll give you uh, you know just a powerful experience. Hi, Sean. Yes, I should be able to join you again. Says Karis. Uh, can't do it tomorrow. Maybe we'll try another time. Uh, maybe we can connect uh, later. That's fine. No problem. All right. So everyone, uh, this is a, a quote from the first book, Connections Based Learning. And I'm just bringing this, uh, this whole talk to a close. Every time I share a person with my students, I have meaning, I have motivation, and I have a chance at empathy. And I truly believe that, that when I, may, when I uh, you know, set up that connection with the students or the students set up a connection, there's a real human being that's sharing their knowledge. It develops meaning for the students. 
It gives them motivation and it gives them a chance to make a difference in the world. All right. Now, I'm just going to show this slide here uh, as, to close my talk, and then I'll definitely answer any questions. And it says, how can you help? You know, learn, share, review. So I've got shortened links. If you're interested in any of the books, it's bit.ly forward slash CBL book. And that's the first one. Or bit.ly uh, bit forward slash CBL book two for the second one. Uh, you know, feel free to do a review, share what you've learned uh, with others. Uh, but that's, I don't want to overwhelm you with uh, information, but that's a little bit of what I've been working on. That's what my journey has been so far. Now, um, Sir Hajwan, um, I've been doing a lot of talking. I want to, you know, get some feedback from people if they want to, you uh, um, uh, turn off mute and ask a question. Fantastic. If they want to put a question in the chat, then you and I can take a look at these questions and answer them. So thank you so much, Sean. Um, it's question and answer session to everyone. So you may ask questions. You can give your feedback too. I know that you have been giving feedback saying it's it's a very, you know, it's an excellent presentation. And Sean, uh, there were some uh, previous responses to the to the previous to the that you had. So okay, in case if you want to look at it, but yeah, you can you can type your questions on the chat or you can unmute yourself. I think what Sean has just shared is very it's it's very impressive and it's consistent what what we are trying to do with our education to get the students to 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 you know help the community and also to to have that global citizenship and um, experience as well so yeah you can ask your questions there or give your feedback on the on the chat they can unmute yourself yeah uh so hajwan i see that sim chiao t kpm oh yeah has raised a hand so feel free to uh yes. unmute and ask your question yeah 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 i i saw it too um Yeah, people are saying thank you for sharing. Okay, yeah. Uh, I just, uh, I'll uh, just respond to some more of the information I see to the side. I do see a very uh, important tip that is uh, crucial for this kind of teaching, and that's to assess um, where the students are at. So accessing prior knowledge is definitely important. And, you know, after you know accessing prior knowledge then then we make the connection or during that time we make that connection uh, i do try to make the connection as soon as possible in the in the project because that allows students to really take it on themselves but definitely we need to assess the the, the students prior knowledge we need to find out what they know uh, one of the things that you might find with this kind of teaching is that it is a leveler that those who uh, maybe have uh, learning disabilities, some students who need you know some different support, we're working together as a group, right? So we we can bring out different strengths and different students. Also, when we're looking at um, making a contribution, right? You can definitely have students make a contribution to. Uh, you know, whether they, they, you know, say some words or they, you know, create something small that they're, they're working on, or they have, maybe they have an aid as well that are working with them. So as opposed to having maybe more of a, you know, like a, a lecture and test kind of structure, this opens the door for a wide range of responses from students who have a wide range of abilities. 
Um, <laughs> so Sean, I think um, yes, I, I I think I can ask some questions, which I believe sure. what what you the Malaysian teachers tend to ask. Sure. So uh, because you know I'm I, I've done I've been to many schools, I've done many workshops too, so I've I've, I've connected with a lot of teachers in Malaysia, mm -hmm. and usually they they do have similar questions or concerns. Um, so I think it's, it's a very interesting project connecting the students with, you know, with people from different parts of the world, with experts and politicians. Uh, so I think in, in Malaysian context, I think a lot of us will wonder, how do you get the student, how do you motivate the students to do it? And how do you get them to feel confident that they are able to do it, that they are able to actually listen, you know, in real time to people's problems of feedback from from experts and actually come up with something because you know i think in in, in malaysia our students they are very uh, you know study oriented they are very exam oriented it's all about passing the exams it's all about you know taking part in competitions and so on but not exactly really pushing beyond that so they so i think in our context with the students if, if, if we try to get our students to do it they might not have the confidence that they, can, they are capable of doing it well, and, and these are great questions. Um, Sirhaj one, I think I've got two responses to that. The first thing I would say is that it's important to do a lot of preparation. So before I make a connection with somebody, we are searching them up. We, we work in groups to create questions, good questions, so that uh, you know, we can have a good dialogue. You saw how I, I made that connection with uh, Karis, the um, stem cell researcher, but then I quickly passed it over to a student. Well, you know, that wasn't something where I just shocked the students, you know, hey, you're, you're on. But no, days before I said, okay, I'm going to ask you to introduce our class. Maybe let's write out something. What are you going to say? just so that they they can feel at ease when they're making that connection and then we'd have a list of questions on the whiteboard so as the students are looking at somebody during a video conference they can see their question right there and all they have to do is look up you know introduce themselves hi my name is and then you know read the okay. question and engage in the dialogue. So I try to make it really easy that the entry level is, you know, it's a low bar. So that's the first part. But then the second part is a, a little bit more nuanced is that we're trying to create a culture here where students feel a little more brave to step out. So uh, I was mentioning to Sir Hajwan that today is my first day with a new group of students. And we spent time, so I'm teaching science, science nine, but we spent time in a community circle right at the beginning. Nobody in the front row, nobody in the back row, everybody equal and level. We spent some community building activity time there, getting to know each other. And then I was able to talk about how in this class, you know, I do ask you to step out of your comfort zone, but uh, I, we do it in a safe way, uh, you know, and we just create that kind of culture where students can take risks. So I think that's the second thing that's a little bit more difficult and it takes time. So you're creating this culture by the third or fourth Skype chat or, you know, video conference or crazy project that Mr. Robinson is saying that we're doing. The students get get kind of used to that. But right at the beginning, you know, I don't think anybody is going to just feel that comfortable to talk to, you know, complete strangers. We really have to work at it. So th that's my response to that, Sir Adjoin. Wonderful. I think, um, I think it gives us ideas on how we can apply this in our classroom. So, you know, preparation. And I think in, in the chat, some of the teachers are responding, yeah, preparation and, um, you know, getting the students to be ready to, to communicate with with the invited guests and and it takes several uh skype chats right not just one skype chat just to for the as the project progresses so there are more and more chats taking places right that's why it's a bit different than you know as teachers we know about a field trip let's say we've heard of many different kinds of field trips right but a field trip is one event 
you're not building necessarily building a relationship with anybody. You go in, you learn a few things, you're out and done. And that is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, making that connection, building that relationship with somebody where once I've, you know, started on something, I usually have students do a, a proposal. This is how I'd like to respond. I don't know if this is going to be helpful to our learning partner. And then we send those proposals to our learning partners and then they can make feedback, you know, give us feedback and say, oh, I don't think that's going to work. I remember one time when we were connecting with Catherine Nakabugo uh, that the, the students wanted to do something. And one of the students that responded back said, well, that's not going to work here. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't use that kind of technology here. And, and so the student had to take the feedback and, yes, yes, uh, you know, apply it to what they were building or, or creating. So, uh, yeah, but it is, you know, it's an organic kind of thing, but all relationships are organic, aren't they? Yes, yes, that's true. So, Sean, um, there's a question from uh, Mr. Tan Siu Ing, or Ms. Tan Siu Ing. Um, it's on the chat. So, some students, so her, some students, they are very weak in many aspects, including language, languages and skills. Teachers do feel very difficult to conduct the classes. Maybe you can share some ideas and suggestions to teachers how to apply this in this group of students. Uh, we are experiencing student. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's the first one from Tan Siu Inc. Uh, so yeah, I think you can look at yourself. You're right. Yeah. Ideas yeah. and suggestions on students who are very weak in in language and skills, and I think the skills here could be also uh, their knowledge, uh, their STEM skills, how much they know about STEM, and and for them to to you know technical skills as well maybe. Yeah, uh, well, I guess in that situation, if you're dealing with language, now I'm also a language teacher, I teach adults English. And I know that when there is um, a language barrier, that that definitely can be difficult. And sometimes it's, you know, we, do, we wouldn't just jump into a video conference, we try to give the students, you know, we go back to that idea of preparation. But if the students need to build some language skills, then I think that's you know quite important before you can communicate. You're you're going to need to build those skills. Uh, we here in Canada we have you know language classes, and maybe you don't have those kind of supports where you know if a student is dealing you know we have many students from all around the world who are um, uh, just learning English and they'll come into the class. Uh, I think it goes, well, well, there's two things. One, to work on that language. Hopefully there are some supports. But the second thing is that we're doing this in, typically we're doing this in a group. So you're going to put some strong students with maybe some of the weaker students in a group and then have them working together. So maybe the weaker students are just, you know, learning the language, listening and participating by by you know just being there and, and listening to what's going on and some of the stronger students are being challenged to use more stem skills i think that that language skills shouldn't stop us from doing something like this but maybe we just have to reorganize how we're going to do it and really planning for you know m those multiple abilities to be together so that um uh, that the stronger students can help the weaker students yeah, that, yeah, that's very important, uh, Sean. I always find it very helpful to, you know, mix the students off of different skills. Uh, I think uh, I'm not so sure whether you're familiar with Malaysian education is because in, in our mainstream schools, the students, they tend to be segregated okay. according to their results. So some, you know, you know, what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to label the students, but I'm for sure this is like a common culture uh, in Malaysian schools. So, you know, some classes, they might get more exposure, they might be more advanced in science and math, in academic performance, and some classes are not. And I think uh, Tan Siu Ying did post a few things there. You know, the, the advanced classes, they might be able to connect. Uh, the, the teachers might feel more confident with them, but the teachers might lack the confidence with the classes that are not exactly meant for that. Um, and I think when it comes to language, yes, if, the, if you are inviting people from from you know countries that don't speak malay language 
but if you're talking about a community everybody can speak malay language so you know language will not be a difficulty a, a difficult uh, a, an issue there um and and i think you know i'm teaching at a vocational school sean so you know for vocational schools our students are more into technical skills and and they are not exactly you know in in stem they are not exactly from stem background but i believe they are able to you know, they have been able to do a lot of projects on their own. If we just give them the opportunity, if we, like what you said, if we prepare them, um, you know, and if we, uh, you know, if we, give them, if we trust them, they will be able to do it. Yeah, uh, you know, you brought something right at the very end, if we trust them. And I think maybe that's one of the toughest things for teachers is to give up more control. Uh, everyone, I have to say, that this kind of teaching when i come to a project many times i think i don't know how this is going to turn out we'll see and you might say well that sounds unprofessional i i think it's actually quite professional because i'm giving ownership to the students right i'm giving agency to the students and when i do that it is uncomfortable as an educator because you might find well you know, if I don't have them under my thumb, things aren't going to go my way, but we need to give our students um, a chance. And this might be the most educational thing we can do for our, student, our, our students is to give them an opportunity to control a little bit more of their destiny. So yeah, that, maybe that's a little bit of a philosophical um, uh, uh, position that I have, but, you know, it's something where, you know, if we can, you know, it's, it's the same with parenting, right? Where, you know, the, the, the hope is that when we're done, they're ready, right? And they don't need you anymore. So, and it's the same thing with our students. You know, we're trying to, you know, we're getting them to a place that they can be independent. And so we do have to take our hands off the reins a little bit more. So maybe something to think about. If you don't feel comfortable with that, maybe something to, you know, take small steps to Thank try you. to give more control to the students. So, yeah, so there are a few questions. Um, there's one question, but, but I think it's a bit similar with, with the previous one. It, it's about the language. Uh, and then there's a question from Sarah, Sarah Ramdas. How can a teacher establish positive relationships with learners, especially learners from remote areas who couldn't understand English? These learners tend to use their mother tongue instead of English. How do we connect, connect students to a lesson if most of them couldn't understand it? So I believe Sarah is also an English language teacher, just like me. Right. So, yeah. Well, uh, you know, that um, I'll talk about the second half and then I'll talk about the first half of the question. The second half says, hey, how do we connect students to a lesson if most of them couldn't understand it? Well, you know, how, how do we teach our students anything if they if they don't understand it? So I think that, you know, that Sarah, that's definitely a difficulty but i don't think it's a difficulty just in making connections i think that's that is you know you know you know that's a bigger problem than simple connections based learning that you know that if uh if if they don't understand i think it goes back to you know step by step preparation getting support that kind of thing but i like the the question that you started off with how can a teacher establish positive relationships with learners now uh you know once again when I talk about connections-based learning, I'm talking about connection in all the ways. And one of the ways is the teacher-student relationship. So, and I, I, I hate to just kind of throw it back to the book, but how could I write a book with, you know, uh, on connection without looking at the teacher-student relationship? So in both of the books, I spend several chapters talking about you know, the teacher student relationship. I, um, you know, some of the things that I do, you know, even this first day of class is that I'm memorizing all the kids' names, right? So that, that when I see them in the hall, I know who they are, you know, so that that day one, I've got their names, I use their names, you know, ask them about themselves. Uh, I spend time, you know, building that positive uh, culture, uh, allowing students to share a little bit about themselves, having that community circle where students are um, being able to just share a little bit about themselves. I've got some activities for that. I even made a Kahoot where students could throw in crazy um, ideas, uh, whether it was true 
or false, just sharing some of their cool things. So really taking the time to build that culture and get to know the students, get to know get the students to know each other, you know, spend a couple of days at the beginning, um, you know, working on those positive relationships. And I think it pays off later on in your semester. Uh, Lillian has raised yeah. a hand. Lillian, go ahead. If you want to unmute, feel free to uh, unmute and you can ask your question. Yeah, there is some feedback on, on the chat from the teachers as well. Okay, well, well Lillian is um, maybe thinking about the question. So yeah, Lillian, uh, you can ask the, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions uh, directly. Yeah, uh, you are and while you're doing that, I, I want to just emphasize Amelia Jane. Uh, so uh, I think sharing the same mother tongue works wonders to develop and sustain professional working teacher pupil relationship and, ship and connectedness. This acts as a springboard for everyone. Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, and then Tan says, it's a very great teacher. Have a good relationship with students and students with students as well. Yeah, that's important. So that the students feel comfortable in the environment. Oh, exactly. and then uh, Madame uh, uh, Kazane, thank you for this. Now I have some ideas on how to connect with my kiddos. Fantastic. I'm happy for that. So yeah, um, so Malaysia, we are quite similar with Canada. We have uh, native or indigenous languages, indigenous people, and right. we have the, the majority, the language is spoken by the majority, and that's Malay language, our national language, and, and of course, Chinese language and Tamil language. So yeah, with, with the mother tongue, when we talk about mother tongue, there are lots of uh, ethnic languages spoken uh, by, by the native tribes, especially in, in Sabah and Sarawak, which are part of the the Borneo Island. Right. Yeah. You'll notice that I took some time to speak a little Malay at the beginning of this. And yes. may, <laughs> maybe you found that you gained a bit of a connection with me. Exactly. exactly. When I did that. Exactly. Yeah. So once once you speak the language, I think it just it just makes everybody feel a lot more comfortable and a lot more excited. So I think yeah. it, the language is is important. Yeah. I, I see Lillian there, but I don't see Lillian um, yeah, coming off yeah. the feet. Thanks a lot. So I think um, I think that's all, Sean. Um, the, I think the, I'm going to share your social again with the with the with the teachers. So everybody, uh, we I really appreciate it. Um, it's a school day in Malaysia actually, so we are all like at school. I'm sure everybody is at schools. Uh, it's Thursday. It's our batik day. Uh, so we are just going to take one group photo, if, if that's okay with you, Sean. So everybody, can you just turn on your camera? It's very important because this will be featured on our social media and maybe on mass media as well. So everybody turn on your freaking camera. Um, Alvina, can you take photos too? So other than me, the rest of you, you can take photos. And if your photos are better than mine, we'll use yours. <laughs> so everybody, before Sean uh, leaves, most of you are very busy too. Uh, Alvina, can you take photos? You have the best laptop. Okay. Can somebody count? I'm going to start counting. Three, two, one. Okay. Okay. Three, three, one. What? We are done with that. So, I'm sorry. So the sorry. rest of you, you will have to wait because I'm going to share the. We're going to share the links for the uh, certificates. For certificates and. Let's break it here. Just wait. Alvina, can you share the link? Yeah, sure. If you have any questions, uh, if you have, you know, you can still ask Sean. He's still here. I'm just trying to share his uh, his social again. So, in case if you if you like to if you like to you know connect with him afterwards.
So yeah, everybody. Um, so this is Sean's uh, Instagram and X, or formerly known as Twitter. So you can uh, you can follow him, and maybe you can you know you can personally text him, maybe just in case. Uh, and I think you can they email you, Sean, if anyone is interested. And you can also check. You can also sure. check his website. That's uh, so that's his uh, Instagram, his CBL, uh, his professional Instagram, and then X is his also uh, Elias SR Twitter. That's his uh, professional Twitter, uh, and then he also has the website uh, Connections Based Learning. Um, I think Sean, thank you so much for your for this session. I think it's amazing. It really inspired us because you know to teach our students be beyond exams, beyond mm -hmm. paper and Pepper and fan uh, assignments, you know, just for them to be really innovative. I think that's that's very important, and it's missing in our education. And you know, in schools, uh, Malaysian schools nowadays, we are encouraging our students to be innovative, to help the community. And I think this is a, a, an excellent way to do so, and not and to help the community based on based on their need and based on professional or expert opinions. You know, which what you have to me. So, yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, you so much, much uh, Sir Hajwan. Uh, it's been great to uh, make a connection to all these uh, fantastic uh, Malaysian educators. I uh, really appreciate the questions. I appreciate your time. Uh, yeah, and I uh, hope to, you know, if you try some of these ideas, you know, yeah, definitely reach out to me and let me know how it goes. I put my email in there. So if there's uh, in the chat, se robinson at sd43.bc.ca. So, you know, feel free to reach out there. If you have any more specific, yes, yes, yeah. So the email is here. So I'm just going to keep uh, pasting it on the chat. Yeah, uh, and to all those people saying thank you, well, you're very welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. Have a nice day. Okay, uh, so Sir Hajwan, I'll sign off now, and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, and we can chat later. You can sign off now. The rest of them they are staying because they are. So the rest of you. Um, you can check on the, the chat. There is an SPL KPM link there and there's a certificate link. And, and I know that the SPL KPM link, if you, uh, if you can't access it, uh, if you can't access it, you know, it might be, um, it's still uploading. It, it might take some time for you to reach it or, you know, it's just in, inaccessible. You can still fill in the certificate link and we have your data and we can update it on SPL KPM link, just in case if you can't access the SPL KPM link, but try to access that SPL KPM link uh, first. And if you have your students with you, obviously the SPL KPM is not relevant to, uh, to them, so you can get them to uh, fill in the certificates link, and they'll get your certificates in the on their email. Now, um, for the certificates, we managed to get Sean's digital signature and also the direct the signature of, of our uh, school of school principals, college director. So yeah, it, it will be nice if you can also fill in the certificate link because you will be able to get a certificate with Sean's uh, digital signature in it. So that's that's really cool. So I'm just going to stop sharing now. Okay, everybody. So you just uh, thank you so much for coming for attending this session. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you too. Oh my God. So I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just going to, uh, what we're going to do is just, we're going to copy and paste the Jasper KPM link again and again, as well as the, the certificate link, so just in, so that you won't lose it.
That's the certificate thing. Okay, so get your students, your for your students, uh, you know, some of them attend this, so get them to fill it in. Uh, and then as for teachers, you fill in this uh, KPM link and also the certificate link if you are interested in getting to this. Going to delete this one because it's a little too. Somebody is trying to join us. Uh, Alvina, are you still recording? I think you can stop the recording now. Is it still recording?